Thank you very much. Um, what is up with the weather up here? Next to this uh, conference in Los Angeles, I think. So let's, let's plan for that. Um, I flew in this morning. I'm very excited to talk to you about Grindr, specifically about chat. Uh, I have been uh, Grindr's CTO for a little bit over two years. Um, and uh, I took that role at the time where company was uh, scaling crazily around the world. So I'll talk today about how to um, build uh, real-time chat, pl chat applications and do it uh, in, in a way so you can actually support global user base. Uh, but before that, let's talk about what Grindr is. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know, Grindr is the first and largest gay dating network in the world. Uh, and uh, the company was started back in 2009 by Joel Simka Simkai, who's our CEO and founder. Uh, he literally founded the company out of his living room. And uh, for the first year and a half, uh, pretty much the whole company was working out of his living room until we actually got our first office. Uh, interesting fact here is that the company never really got any funding. It was started with a couple of thousands of dollars. And uh, because it was monetized very quickly, uh, we are a private company and this 100% ownership is actually by, by the founders. So it's, it's one of those crazy stories that you don't hear very often. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of technology, really, Grindr started um, by uh, writing a uh, PHP application. And um, um, you know, Joel is not a technical guy, he's a businessman. So he found uh, a couple of developers in Europe who, who essentially helped him build the first iteration of the app and the backend services. And uh, you know, they really didn't know how successful the app is going to be. So they, they essentially wrote it in PHP very quickly, stood it up, and uh, you know, they, they had this hosting uh, service that, that they went with. And uh, the moment that the app started exploding, uh, they had to upgrade their hosting plan from like bronze to silver. Uh, then they, you know, they ran for three months like that and then ran out of capacity again. So they had to go and upgrade to you know, the, the platinum plan and, and they very quickly ran out of that. Uh, you know, um, the grinder was mentioned on Top Gear at some point in, in uh, England, and, and that brought down the service completely. And um, uh, what ended up happening is that, you know, we ran out of the hosting capacity at the time. And, uh, you know, the question was, like, what's going to happen next? And, and the developers were like, really, Joel, you're kind of screwed now because you have to really go into clustering and you have to distribute your application, all that type of stuff. And, um, so, so probably around a year, year and a half into into this, uh, you know, we had to hire uh, people and experts who, who, who could do that, right? Um, and uh, one of the use cases that we needed to solve was essentially, uh, as a Grindr user, I want to be able to reliably exchange chat messages in real time with other Grindr users around me. Um, simple enough, uh, if you look at it. But uh, once you already have global user base, uh, once you are doing pretty serious traffic, then it's, it's not really easy to do. These days, if you're actually studying comp sci, building chat applications is, is, is kind of like a project. Um, but uh, once you want to take that and actually do it at scale, uh, it becomes a little bit difficult. So let's talk about scale a little bit and what uh, Grindr is. So we have uh, millions of users in over 198 countries around the world these days. If you look at our user distribution, it kind of looks like that, um, with the uh, majority of our user base uh, being in uh, uh, North America, then Europe, and, and South America. Uh, if you were to actually add these three markets together, then that's going to be probably uh, be around 80% of our user base. And uh, um, we have around uh, 10 million daily active users. Uh, and uh, at uh, any given time, uh, we may have over 1 million people actually chatting on the platform. So uh, you know, it is not the scale of something like WhatsApp, because wha WhatsApp probably doing, uh, is doing 4 billion me messages per day. Uh, we're doing around 100 million messages per day. 
So they are dealing with scales that are completely crazy. Uh, however, uh, 100 million messages per day is also pretty difficult to scale. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the infrastructure uh, and a couple of stats. So um, as far as the uh, architecture is concerned, uh, Grindr uh, app is powered by two type of protocols. Uh, one protocol is uh, HTTP-based RESTful calls uh, to the backend infrastructure, but the chat specifically is powered by the XMPP protocol, which is different. It's a stateful protocol that actually ends up uh, creating a persistent connection from your client to the server. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned, we process around 100 million messages uh, per day. That averages anywhere between 1,000 to 1,500 messages per second. Um, and um, we also allow users exchange media uh, through the chat uh, platform. However, when we looked at the architecture, uh, we wanted to make sure that um, we actually don't embed media content as part of the messages because that just saturates the, the, the chat message traffic. Uh, what we end up doing, if you're, if you're sending something like image or if, if in the future we're going to be allowing sending video and all that type of stuff, uh, we actually have uh, endpoints that allow us to accept the content. We create like this media handle for that content and that, contact, uh, that, that media content handle is then exchanged via a chat network. Uh, so that allows us to offload some of the pressure from the um, back end. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, when I started with Grindr two years ago, uh, till this day I remember uh, Christmas of 2013, and um, you know I, I started on uh, Halloween, uh, so I started literally on the on the um, gay Christmas, and then uh, uh, two months into being on the job, uh, y you know the 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 chat went down. Uh, at the time. The biggest complaint from the users uh, of Grindr was that we were losing messages, uh, platform was not, not stable, uh, and uh, what ended up happening is that literally the, the service was going, going down all, almost every day. Uh, and on Christmas 2013, I, I actually went to uh, Big Bear um, and Silly Me, you know, I went to a place without internet connection. Uh, so. Um, on the first day of the holiday, uh, essentially the, 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 the chat traffic was so big that it took down the infrastructure, and uh, we, we didn't know how to bring it back up. People who already configured the stuff and wrote the, the code were not with the company anymore. I was literally uh, you know, logging into repository in my car, um, you know, mooching off uh, Starbucks Wi-Fi, uh, looking at the code and, and who committed what and then Googling their name, trying to figure out where they actually worked. Uh, so so that, was my, that was my introduction kind of to the infrastructure, the scale, and, and, and the state of it. Um, so so uh, we, we, I pretty quickly realized that we needed to do a, a major overhaul of, of a lot of different services. And, and chat was really at the, at the core of that. It was a priority number one for me because chat is really the core of the offering of the app, right? So um, when I started looking at the infrastructure, the first thing I, I, I wanted to, to do is, is to see uh, where the, where the chat, is, uh, chat traffic is coming from and uh, what it meant in terms of latencies. Because when you're writing a real-time chat application, uh, the latency is is uh, one of the biggest things that you need to care for, and if you look at the um, if you remember the the um, diagram of our user distribution, and where the biggest user um, um, body is, it, you, you can kind of see that it it matches your corresponding latencies. Uh, so. All our chat traffic at the time uh, ended up in. Uh, uh, actually, um, Amazon. Uh, this is this is Virginia because we moved everything to Rackspace. But it used to be in Amazon on the East Coast. Uh, the the latency still do, uh, though applies. So if you actually were to measure the the message latencies uh, from around the world, you you you're doing very very well in the U.S. 
in Europe, you're, you're around 500 milliseconds, 800 milliseconds in South America, and the further uh, you, you move away from your infrastructure, your latency starts stacking up. So, so when you're designing your infrastructure, you kind of have to uh, answer the question, where is my user base, right? If you're, if you're writing a mobile app that is targeting only US, then you're in a much better shape because our mobile networks are much better. Uh, you can, uh, y y you know, access to cloud infrastructure is very, very easy, and and you can, you can, you can essentially design in a way so you can actually provide even better response time. Um, but when when you're designing your chat chat application for the global user base, the reality is is that very quickly you will have to start about. Um, distribute on, uh, distributing that infrastructure around the world, uh, which means that you want to be bringing your uh, backend services as close to your user base as possible. Um, you can do that through various different means, either by using Amazon Cloud. Uh, the problem is that uh, what we found out, uh, you know, when, when you're building a chat application and you select, let's say, something like XMPP backend, uh, then uh, there, there are various different choices for XMPP implementation. There are Java-based uh, uh, XMPP implementation, there's C, C++, uh, and there are also Erlang-based. So we at the time were using eJabrd, which is Erlang-based um, open source XMPP chat server. Uh, and Erlang, uh, eJabrd uses something called Amnesia Database. Amnesia Database is very, very sensitive to network latencies. Uh, variances that you may observe in the cloud. And actually, what ended up bringing us down was the fact that our infrastructure was sitting in the cloud. Uh, so uh, so uh, wh when, you, when you're building something like this, uh, y you need to make sure that, that yes, you, you load test it, but uh, you also need to talk to the people who actually wrote the thing and, and, and make sure that it, it, is, it is going to be doing OK in the cloud, right? So one of the first things that we've, did, we've done in the Q1 of 2014 was we said, OK, so obviously Jeopardy is not very happy in, in, in a cloud. We're going to actually move it back onto dedicated hardware. So that's, that's we switched over to Rackspace. And um, by doing so, we, we brought a lot of stability to the platform. So the servers were not going down anymore. We didn't have to constantly recluster and rebuild them. Uh, we actually invested in some pretty heavy hardware that we fine-tuned. And through my exercise, by looking and Googling people names on the laptop, I actually found out who the developers were who made the modifications. I found out where they work, and uh, I reached out to the company uh, called Erlang Solutions in Eastern Europe um, that specializes in actually um, building uh, you know, high-scale child ap applications using Erlang Stack. So. Um, one tip for, for, for you guys, if, if you want to go for scale, you, you have a startup, you have a small team, don't try to do everything yourself, right? You need to establish these key uh, strategic partnerships with people who are actually specialists in this area. Um, and um, for us, we actually found, because we were on their Lang stack, because we're using XMPP, uh, we, we've actually established partnership with Erlux Solutions, and, and their developers actually now extend our engineering staff and, and write a lot of, a lot of customizations. Um, so uh, another thing that you need to solve for is the storage part. So imagine you have uh, this chat application and you want to uh, do guaranteed delivery of messages, which means that you need to have some sort of uh, storage mechanism. Uh, either because you want to be fault tolerant, if something goes down, you still want to recover, um, or I if you want to start analyzing those messages in the future. So, so there are a couple of different options there. We uh, transitioned away from the SQL-based storage. Uh, around the same time, we, won we went with the uh, MongoDB, uh, and MongoDB uh, worked very well for us. Uh, we are now actually, since then, we've, also, uh, we, we've transitioned to another technology because MongoDB is not very good at uh, geographically, uh, to shard it geographically, to set up geosharding is very difficult. Um, so that's something that you need to also watch for. We've actually moved our storage to DynamoDB in Amazon. Uh, Dynamo is very attractive because uh, it's one of those Amazon solutions where 
uh, you, you know, you just kind of pay as you go, and Amazon does all the heavy lifting when it comes to scaling, sharding, and all that good stuff. So if you're a startup and you have the, if you have the money, uh, you know, I, I would, I would really consider that technology. Um, now, whether we're gonna stay on DynamoDB, that's another question. Uh, DynamoDB had a huge, huge outage three, three, three months ago, where pretty much a uh, whole uh, US uh, um, East, I think, infrastructure went down, uh, at, which, at which point we actually found out that Dynamo doesn't offer standard SLAs like some of the other products, and it's kind of like surprise, surprise. Um, so so we, we may actually be transitioning away from Dynamo into something else. So we are actually playing with different technologies. We are considering Cassandra, um, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, one thing that I would, I would caution you is that when, when you're building these things and, and, and uh, you're starting, starting to scale up again, try to partner up with companies that, that really know what they're doing. Um, what I've seen is, unfortunately, a lot of uh, developers tend to, um, you know, they want to play with cool stuff, and they, they think that, oh, I'm just going to read some Google articles, and then I'm going to go on Stack Overflow, and I'm going to figure it out, um, which is true largely, and that's awesome. But the moment you actually stand up a, a, a production infrastructure and you're pushing some heavy traffic, and that stuff goes down, and you've got no one there who is an expert, then, then you're in trouble, right? Um, so the first year of me being a grinder, 2014, was really forming those strategic relationships, hiring the people, and, and picking and choosing uh, what kind of developers I'm going to actually hire in-house, as opposed to just form uh, some sort of contracts with, with companies that specialize in that technology. Um, okay, and then uh, let's talk about uh, spam. So spam is, is uh, a huge problem for any chat network. Uh, we've been having a really, really la rough year. Uh, last, uh, last year, around uh, June, July, some Yahoo in Germany ended up uh, um, decompiling our client and uh, essentially figuring out all the security token exchange scheme. And he, he decided to post it on on the web, so since since then, uh, you know, there's been really a, a rash of whole bunch of different bots that people wrote to to essentially create fake accounts and then mimic users and then talk to 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 our users uh, through through our chat network. So um, w one thing that we've been working on really for the last 12 months is. Uh, how do we shut down spam? And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it at the end. Um, but one, one thing that we've done immediately is we, we said, okay, so if, I ha if I'm processing 1,000 to 1,500 messages per second, how can I detect spam and be effective? Um, and the reality is that you need to then start looking at pretty uh, sizable big data technologies to be able to uh, detect patterns in your in your uh, message uh, the the messages that are being processed. So, uh, what we've done immediately, we essentially took a 10 minute slice of all the chat traffic, and we built a big data infrastructure that would look for it would analyze all the messages and it would look for certain patterns. So you can use something like ngrams to kind of see whether messages are similar if you have certain amount of words that are similar, then you can start flagging the users. And uh, you can also start measuring rate of messages being sent. Um, the reality is that, you know, yes, we've done that, um, but uh, the, 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 the moment you start shutting people down this way, uh, all they do is adapt. So you're actually forcing the spammers to, to evolve, right? So it's kind of like this very organic thing. Uh, and um, there's a different solution that is needed here, uh, and I'll talk about it at the end. It's going to actually come online in uh, the next couple of months. Uh, so let's talk about actual architecture of our uh, chat um, application. Like I mentioned, uh, there are two different protocols um, powering our apps. I think there's this thingy here. Perfect. So we have our uh, Grinder mobile applications talking with the 
Um, our main infrastructure, which sits in Amazon, um, the new infrastructure that launched actually this year in June is uh, based on non-blocking IO ACA um, framework, which is Scala-based. And then we use Java to write our business uh, logic. Uh, we've transitioned away from Ruby on Rails, so our um, kind of technology evolution follows very closely what Twitter does. Did. So they start. We started, and they started on PHP. Then moved on to Rails, uh, Ruby on Rails, and then uh, um, it's it's Scala and Java based. Um, and then uh, the actual chat is powered by this Mongoose IM. Mongoose IM is essentially uh, XMPP server, enterprise grade, Erlang based, uh, and uh, it sits on Rackspace dedicated servers. And essentially, that's powering this whole stateful XMPP protocol. And there are integration points between uh, both infrastructures for various different reasons. There are real-time infrastructure integration, and there's also queue-based integration for near real-time. And um, we used to, um, you know, we used to do Redis in-house and RabbitMQ in-house. I, I said that a lot of ops people think that they can build it themselves and uh, the reality is that uh, at this scale you want to again partner with professionals so what we've ended up doing is that the new stack is very very low touch when it comes to ops so uh, all the stuff that was in-house managed by by people by hand we we've made partnerships one of the two key partnerships that we've made uh, here is we've actually partnered with redis labs uh, so our Redis cluster now is managed by their uh, people, and uh, you know that that thing is processing um, on average around 300,000 ops per second, uh, and that cluster can scale up to around a million. So we've got some headway there. And the same uh, Cloud MQP is another company that they have like this secret sauce how to scale at, at scale um, the, your your messaging framework, right? So. Um, so that's kind of our stack. And uh, one thing that I wanted to say here is it, it is very um, tempting sometimes to uh, mix different protocols in order to achieve uh, durability of the transaction because it's easy, right? Mobile developers are very, very comfortable working with REST. Uh, they are very uncomfortable working with anything else. Uh, and that's because that's you don't see that very often, right? So, so restful, everyone is happy, happy, happy. The moment you start asking them to work with XMPP, everyone kind of steps back, right? So what ends up happening is that if you allow uh, developers to make decisions how to implement things, then they're gonna do everything in REST, right? So what, 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 ends, what ended up happening with Grindr is that um, uh, you know, the, the whole durability of message delivery was being attempted by, uh, was attempted to be implemented by doing ACKs of messages via REST uh, and, uh, and the actual delivery and routing messages through XMPP because that was supported by open source libraries. And uh, the moment you start mixing your HTTP, which is stateless protocol, with stateful protocol, you have major, major synchronization problems, especially at the scale if your infrastructure is sitting in, at, at different places. Uh, so, so, so that contributes to a lot of issues when it comes to lost messages because your SEKs never make them in time or you have duplicates. Uh, it's a mess, right? So. Uh, one of one of the things that we're doing right now, uh, and that's actually launched um, a couple of months ago, uh, we said, okay, we're gonna we're not going to do anything chat related here, right? But we need to be doing, uh, you know, XMPP has a lot of rich extensions that can aid your development in actually robust chat framework. Uh, one of them is this uh, XCP0333 which are chat markers. And uh, you can think about this. Uh, those, are, those are the markers that allow you to say, hey, something was delivered to the server, then it was delivered to the destination, the mobile device, it was actually opened, uh, that type of stuff, right? Um, the, the, the problem is, and there's a whole bunch of other uh, advanced chat um, extensions, that the problem is that none of that stuff is available through open source libraries. Right, so you actually have to make an investment 
uh, and and build it yourself, uh, both on the service side and on the on the client side as well. So uh, one of the things that we've been doing to improve the chat implementation was we've actually been building a lot of these custom uh, chat features on the service side and on the client side uh, to be able to move away from this JSON-based uh, kludge that was developed. Um, now, uh, the new clients are going to launch uh, sometime in Q1. We've been working on completely rewriting uh, our um, um, Android iOS clients. Uh, so, so those those new clients will have uh, essentially implementation where where we'll be relying fully on XMPP protocol uh, to do all, all our chat, right? Uh, so, and and that sh that should essentially close the loop fully to have not only great infrastructure cleaned up, uh, scaling, uh, but also the clients themselves they will be able to acknowledge message exchange and delivery using the XMPP protocol like it is intended, right? Uh, now, when, when you're building games, um, chat is one thing that you wanna, wanna sometimes build in, but a lot of gaming companies are actually using XMPP protocol to do a lot of real-time um, exchange of data. Uh, and that is also relevant because uh, you, know, you, you want to be paying attention to these things uh, because of the quality of mobile networks. Uh, mobile ne networks are notorious at dropping connections, uh, and a lot of times if you don't have your F5 uh, load balancer or any other load balancer co configured correctly, what ends up happening is that your client may drop a connection, but your F5 will still think that it is connected, and, and you've got troubles, right? So there's a lot of stuff that needs to be going on here on your load balancing side and the client side to kind of figure out that, that secret sauce of configuration. Uh, and by the way, that varies by region, right? So if you're doing it globally, then, then you need to remember that, you know, networks, uh, mobile networks in Europe are very different than in US. And they are very different in, let's say, South America, right? Okay, um, we talked about, okay, let's move to the next one. Um, and uh, so this is this is something that we're going next uh, to uh, when it comes to chat. Uh, so uh, I if you remember, um, we had uh, oopsie. If you remember, we had essentially uh, U.S. Virginia region in uh, Rackspace here. Um, I really don't like dealing with direct hardware anymore. This is this is. Uh, I would only do it if if, if it's necessary. Uh, we're actually moving our chat infrastructure into cloud. Uh, so what we are going to be doing is uh, we're working with Erlang Solutions to help us identify all the pieces in the Erlang stack that are essentially um, not very happy with, with cloud variances. And we're going to be replacing those technologies with things like Redis, for example. So uh, the Amnesia database that I talked about that is being used very heavily by, by Mongoose IM and eJabberD, that's going to be gone and replaced with Redis. And uh, once we do that, then what we're going to do is we will actually take our XMPP server infrastructure and we will distribute it into five different data centers. And we will essentially set up something called federated chat cluster, right? So within each of the regions, you're going to have your local cluster, which is still high availability, and those will be serving your local chat traffic. Uh, but these clusters will be all aware of each other through federation mechanism. And uh, the good news is that uh, you know most of the traffic, because we are a location-based app, so you, you, you mostly, uh, most of the time you're going to be talking to people around you, right? But we need to account for a use case that, let's say, you're in US and you're going to um, Japan for vacation. You meet someone there. You still want to talk to them if you go back. Well, that's the use case that needs to be supported, which means that uh, your, once you go back, your US cluster needs to be aware of the one in the um, Asia Pacific region and route your messages accordingly. Right. So all these guys need to be aware of each other. Uh, another bonus that you get here is because now your infrastructure is now distributed uh, into these local data centers, uh, your latencies uh, are going to go down, your chat application is going to be much more stable, 
right? Because if 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 you are if the phone talks to the infrastructure that's very close by, you have less chances of uh, that 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 connection that that traffic essentially degrading uh, as you're moving through different hops. Um, so that's that's uh, that's going to happen in 2016, um, and uh, uh, and I mentioned about Amazon DynamoDB. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, again attractive technology because uh, Amazon also supports multi-master replication using streams. Not out, out, out not out of the box, but um, I know there are people who who have done that. Which which allows you to then distribute your 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 chat storage across these different data centers, um, and the last uh, the last um, good thing here is that through this architecture you can actually um, achieve uh, global high availability, which means that if your let's say Asia Asia Pacific region goes down for whatever for their whatever reason, if you have your routes set up correctly. Then you can actually you, the the rest of your uh, data centers can actually pick up that traffic, right? Um, the the problem that we have today is that we don't have this, right? So all all our traffic ends up uh, in uh, in uh, Amazon US East, um, and uh, you know if if that particular data center has has a problem, then 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 we're pretty much dead in the water. Uh, this is going to come online by summer of next year. Um, in order to accomplish this sort of distribution on infrastructure, you really need to think about um, how you manage your ops. Uh, so automation, automation, automation. Uh, you need to be invested into tools that allow you to do infrastructure as code, right? So your ops people need to move from scrolling around on the server directly. They need to be in the mode where they write the infrastructure code on their laptop or computer, and they're, 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 then they're provisioning pipelines, then take that code, check it into the repository, and then build infrastructure from that repository. It's a very different mindset. Uh, those are kind of um, advanced op skills, right? Okay. And. Uh, Let's talk about um, the last piece here. So this is what the uh, architecture is going to look like uh, when I actually move the uh, airline into the Amazon cloud. Uh, now, if I want to be uh, innovative, move very fast, uh, play around with a whole bunch of different chat features, maybe do video, maybe do a whole bunch of different stuff, uh, it is very unrealistic to do it through using XMPP on a client directly. So if you look at this architecture, uh, this assumes that clients talk to the backend using REST uh, or some other HTTP-based protocol. The reason why, again, is mobile developers are comfortable with that and they can do it in their sleep, right? If, if you ask them to do advanced stuff using uh, things like XMPP, uh, everything comes to the grinding halt, and uh, it is very difficult to develop. Uh, you need to have a lot of um, testing that needs to happen. So one of the things that we also have on our roadmap is this XMPP gateway. Uh, so what we are going to do is we are going to build a um, HTTP-based gateway that will translate XMPP traffic onto HTTP protocol. Uh, which will then allow us to add, um, you know, into our Grinder SDK chat functionality, but that chat functionality is going to be using HTTP protocol. Um, so that that is after we distribute everything globally. That's that's the next thing for us. Uh, some of the decisions that we need to make is is what what that's going to look like. Some of the choices out there, you know, you've got Speedy, you've got server side events. You've got long polling. You've got web sockets. You can do a whole bunch of different things here, um, but the 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 goal for us to is to simplify the development for the for the mobile development uh, mobile developers while uh, providing this ecosystem where you have really robust architecture. Um, and uh, in order to do that, we feel we need to really develop this piece. Um, that's gonna probably start end of next year. Um, 
Now, between then and now, maybe there are gonna, going to be some other companies that are going to come online and actually provide this functionality out of the box. Um, I would be very happy if, if they can actually do that at scale. One of the companies that is very, very promising is uh, Layer, I believe. Layer came out um, with their solution um, not that far ago. We've been talking to them, um, but um, I don't feel um, when it comes to scale and distributing across the world like, like we need to do, they, they are not there yet. So uh, hopefully in a couple of years they will be, and, and then maybe we can actually integrate. Uh, but uh, what Layer has done very well, they, they have this piece. So, so um, they, they actually have REST APIs, uh, I'm sorry, speed, they have speedy APIs that, that you can use to talk to the backend infrastructure, right? Which, is, which makes chat development very easy from the client, develop, from the client perspective. Um, but you need to ask yourself, okay, if, if I'm building for millions and millions of users and I'm gonna have pretty heavy traffic and it's gonna be global, what that's going to be looking like on the back end, right? Am I going to have dedicated servers? Are they going to be isolated from all the other clients? You know, th those are the questions that, that you need to be asking. Cool. So hopefully I didn't muddle the water for you. <laughs> but uh, if you have any questions, yes. on your radar at all? Yes, so we, we, when we're designing um, our clients in the back end, we are looking at a couple of things. So there is, a, um, there is essentially how do you store your data at rest on the client, right? Uh, so that's one thing. Then how you store your data at rest on the server side and then, and then the pipe, right? So right now all our chat traffic is encrypted using TLS, uh, but we don't actually have an additional layer of encryption uh, across the pipe. This is something that is on our radar, or HMAC, or something like that, yes. So, so we, we may do that something like that in next year, um, but uh, what we are going to do first is uh, we're going to do uh, client-side certificates. We're gonna do SSL pinning first, uh, and then we are also uh, going to make sure that uh, we are raising the bar in terms of what the client security looks like, so it's not easy to just download it, our client and decompile it. So there's going to be new clients actually uh, going to be employing technology that obfuscates and encrypts the code. Um, so so that, that way it's much harder to crack our door, right? Um, and, then, and then once that's done, then, then we will be focusing on, on, the, on the transmission of data. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm a client-side de developer for a gaming company, and um, I haven't done mobile yet personally. What is the hang-up with uh, HTTP instead of uh, XM? Like, why would a mobile developer be so squeamish? Like, what are their what are their actual objections to using XMPP? I, I think it's primarily the uh, availability of open source libraries, and then how many people actually have done it. So. Uh, with REST and HTTP, you can go to Stack Overflow and any question you have an answer, right? For, for XMPP and, and some of the I don't know, more fancier stuff out there, uh, there's just not that many answers. You have to figure it out yourself. And, and if you're in a pressure, uh, under pressure, especially at the ga gaming company, if you're under pressure and you need to deliver really fast, then you know, that's, that could be a problem. You mentioned earlier about um, like fraudulent users, and you're looking at like engrams and like message rates. But um, I th think you also just answered questions about like uh, client encryption and stuff like that. Is that where you're going towards? Yes. Yeah, so, so let me talk about spam a little bit because that's 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 the priority number one for my team right now. Um, so we're taking really two two uh, two prong approach. Number one is we need to make sure that the door to our house is harder to break, right? Um, um, the, the reality is that current client uh, uses security, mobile security approaches, which were good maybe two years ago or three years ago, but uh, the industry has since transitioned, right? So 
the, the, the new clients that are going to be coming online will be using new security model. Uh, and that will essentially ensure that uh, you know a kid with a laptop and uh, you know second year of CompSci can can just you know figure this stuff out, right? So we're gonna take this bar and move it a little bit higher. So so it's not gonna be easy to just download our client or set up man in the middle proxy and figure things out. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, enhancements to make sure that. Uh, it's not easy to decompile our code. It's not easy to figure out the token exchange schemes and all that stuff, right? Um, in addition to that, though, the reality is that um, if, if someone is committed and they have money and resources and know-how, they will crack the door, right? Uh, so the, the key to this problem is actually building a, an intrusion detection system uh, that actually uh, watches the behavior of the users in the network while they're already in. So we, we've, uh, we've actually invested a lot into um, data scientists and we're actually building a, a system that is uh, measuring user behavior in the network. There's, there's a lot of different data points, around 20 different data points that we measure. Things like what is your geovelocity? Uh, at what rate and when you're calling the APIs, right? Um, are you talking to the people that you actually saw in the cascade? Uh, are you talking to the people while you're online, right? So there's there's a whole bunch of different things, right? There's also there there's also things that uh, you know we can actually measure certain things on the client side in terms of uh, accel accelerometer data and, and uh, from the device, so, so we can actually tell whether you're a real person or not. So, so, so with that uh, a solution coming online early on next year, we will be able to start sanitizing traffic based on taking all these different data points, calculating each user's um, uh, trust index, right? And based on that trust index, we will also be uh, shutting, uh, shutting the, the fraudulent people down, right? Now, the key here is that we will not be banning these users. Um, the key here is that you need to create something called honeypot, which means that you need to send them to a system that still looks and feels and smells like as if it was Grindr, but it's really not. Because you want, you want to slow the, the evolution adaptation process. You don't want to, by shutting people down, forcing them to, 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 uh, to essentially um, evolve and make it even harder for us, right? So, so what, what, we, what, what we need to do is essentially create that system, send those people there, so, so now they have to QA their own bots to make sure that they are working. And that's not easy thing to do. And we will have our own bots talking to their bots. Um, when moving between different database stacks, uh, how do you deal with the difference in, say, consistency semantics? Like, for example, uh, DynamoDB uh, always succeeds on writes, but the reads may not be reliable, right? So I think that is, um, <laughs> uh, I, I always strive for eventual consistency. Uh, with, with large distributed systems, um, uh, you, you cannot expect to get the performance that you need and have the, the immediate consistency w in, in the data, right? So the clients need to account for that. The way you're designing your APIs, designing your clients, you need to essentially say, hey, uh, the way I structure my transactions and, and the cash on the client, I need to make certain assumptions, right? So what we do is that, um, you know, I, so for example, uh, let's say I, I make an update, right? Uh, our clients don't make an update and then immediately reread the same data, right? They essentially, they, they make an update, you trust the, 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 um, the response code that you're gonna get and you're gonna assume that, okay, that data has been pushed. I, ha I know what I saved, so I'm gonna be using that until it eventually refreshes, right? So, so you, you need to design your clients in that way. Five minutes late? Uh, uh, left, okay. I'm like, <laughs> it, was, hey. it was red, I'm like, whoa. 
Is uh, Grinder ever going to uh, have another product besides chat? I'm sorry. Is Grinder ever going to have another product besides chat? Is it going to? Is there going to be more features? Yes. So as a company, we are actually evolving. Um, so so I can tell you that the next uh, couple of years are really really excited for me. Exciting for me. Um, they uh, we we will be transitioning into a lot of lifestyle services to enhance gay men's life, lifestyle. Um, I can't really say what that's going to be. But um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we will be transitioning beyond just just chat and and meetups. Um, next year and year after that, yeah, yeah. You were talking about offloading the media from the chat stream uh, so that you can you know free up bandwidth and such. What do you actually do with the media? Where do you put it? So the media is actually stored in uh, an S3 bucket. And uh, we have probably the, the biggest library of dick pics in the world. <laughs> so yes. Um, so, but, but yeah, so, so all the media goes uploaded to the server, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, you get a media handle. Um, and then the, that media handle gets actually exchanged in the, in the chat network, right? Uh, and uh, as far as the media itself, it's a, it's a very interesting piece of data. I know that uh, we, we are, as a company, at some point we want to get into a uh, better recommendations engine. So, you know, based on your, the, the, the people that you like, we can actually start analyzing the photos for certain patterns. Uh, do you guys, do you like the guys with, without shirts on? Or, you know, the abs or whatever, right? Uh, and then deriving certain characteristics that you're as a user looking for, and then try to look for people with the same characteristics. Right? So that's one use case. Is Grinder currently hiring? <laughs> yes, we are hiring. Thank you. Uh, we are hiring. We are actually hiring across the board. We are hiring for back end, front end, uh, data science teams. Uh, I've been actually sizing for a lot of the expansion in, in lifestyle. Um, I, I need to pretty much triple the size of my team the next 12 months. So that's going to be uh, pretty challenging. Um, right now we are geographically distributed. We actually have teams in Argentina and in uh, Poland and Croatia. I'm actually flying next week to bring another team online. So um, we, 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 we go where the developers and talents are, is. Um, but uh, I, I do want to build the core team in LA that's driving a lot of architectural decisions. So, and I think we have a better weather than San Jose. So, yeah, if you guys are interested, go to grinder.com slash jobs um, and you'll, you'll see what, what's out there. So we, we do that internally for our own uh, purposes. I don't think uh, we are at the point yet where we want to actually make that data public. It's, it's, it's very sensitive stuff, right? Um, so I, I think that we want to use that data to get our platform better in terms of recommendations, where, where are the guys, what are the hot places around. Um, but uh, in terms of actually taking that data and, and packaging it and selling, um, I don't see that on the roadmap yet, right? And if we were to do that, it would be only very, very high level aggregates. Uh, I couldn't help but noticing, but that, I couldn't help but noticing but that some parts of that map uh, did not have the Grindr logo on them. Uh, it's true that in some countries, especially like Saudi Arabia, Middle East, uh, parts of Africa, uh, the police are on Grindr and they look at like they use the location, they correct? Like they, did they find uh, people where correct. being so gay is against so the law? Uh, where, w w what are your plans on um, maybe uh, ex either expanding those countries and also uh, helping out uh, the oppressed gay people in those countries? W yes. So we've released actually last summer we we released uh, a a pretty significant security patch. Um, we call that bad neighborhoods. So. 
uh, we what what happens is that if you decide to hop on a plane and and fly to Tehran, uh, we uh, essentially disable a lot of transmissions that are happening between client and the server, which means that the functionality of the client is reduced. Uh, but y it is it is almost impas impossible to you try to use trilateration, for example, to pinpoint someone location. Uh, we've done that because we've noticed that uh, you know some governments are actually using our platform to to find people out. Um, so so I, th I think combination with what with that and what we're doing security wise, hardening our stance um, that that should improve things much uh, uh, for for everyone. Um, but uh, we do have users in all those countries, so. Yeah. So so yeah. So so essentially, it's a geofence, right? So you fly in. We detect that you're within that geofence, and uh, and essentially we, we shut down uh, certain pieces of information that are, that are being sent between client and the server, which reduces your functionality of the app. But it it is still functional, but but it's much harder to to mine the information, right? Cool. Thank you.